Speaker Kevin McCarthy's debt ceiling plan narrowly passed the House last night with the help of House Republicans, Georgia Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene being one of them. She joins us now to discuss. Welcome, Congresswoman. Thanks. Hi. Thanks for having me on. Yes, thank you so much for joining us. Why don't you take a minute to explain why you supported uh, this deal? Do you think it goes you know, far enough in, in constraining government spending, something you and yeah, you know, other uh, conservative members of the Republican Party in the House have articulated is an important priority? I really appreciate that question. Um, actually, of course, for me, it, nothing goes far enough. We're a nation and over $31 trillion in debt and to me, that doesn't have a one political party on it. It has both political parties on it because it took us decades to get to this point. But it was really um, the most recent year's spending that has pushed us completely out of control. Um, and none of us here ever wanted to be put in a position to raise the debt ceiling. But the reason why I was able to support this bill and excited to get behind it is because we cut $4.8 trillion in spending. And as a fiscal conservative, that's something that I can get behind. But what's more important to me is once we get this package and this deal done and completely out of the way, we can move on to the real work, which is the budget and appropriations. That's where we have the real power to actually make changes and help get spending under control uh, for the American people. In a recent 60 Minutes interview, you said that this is a spending problem, um, not a tax problem. And you resisted uh, pushes to, say, tax the wealthy, something that majorities of Americans support, and didn't seem to really focus on cutting the military budget as a way to bring down cost, despite uh, being a, a significant critic of the war in Ukraine, et cetera. There's been a lot, a significant conversation right now that Tucker has left Fox News about right populism versus left populism. Populism. And the differences between them seem to be largely about a willingness to go after elites and the rich on a financial level and do things like cut taxes for the rich, incur military spending. What do you say to folks that wonder why you won't go after elites in those sorts of ways? Well, all of these are great topics, and, and I really appreciate you bringing them up. Um, let me unpack that a little bit because that was quite a few things. Um, number one, I don't want to cut United States military spending. I want to stop all of the money being spent in the proxy war against Russia in Ukraine. I believe that's where the American people can save a lot of money. Uh, Ukraine is not a NATO member nation. This was something that President Biden acknowledged, acknowledged from the very beginning. And uh, we're not, we should not be defending Ukraine's border while our border is completely out of control. So I would like to see changes there. I strongly support our military and I want to fund a, a, the strongest military in the world and that being our own military, but I don't want to uh, fund a war in, in Ukraine against nuclear powered Russia. Secondly, we have, a, we have a spending problem in Washington DC, definitely not a revenue problem. Washington rakes in plenty of money but the spending is out of control. And again, I blame both parties for that. Um, the federal government is too big, it's overbloated. And as a business owner, that's what I've done most of my life. When you have too much overhead, you have to reel it back in. And that's how you get your company back under control. And we need to do that for our country. The federal government needs to be treated like a, like a successful business, not a business that's on the verge of bankruptcy. Um, thirdly, uh, for, for Fox News, uh, one of the biggest media companies in our country, to fire their top guy, Tucker Carlson, um, I think is, is a, a very dangerous sign for America. I think it's an assault on our First Amendment. And I, I really value um, a free press. I do. This is something I talk about frequently. And when a, when a media company fires their top guy, the guy that's bringing them in the most money, the most revenue, the most ad dollars. Um, it really shows something's wrong. And what I believe happened there is Fox News caved to the woke mob and they were being sued on multiple levels, uh, really in political nature. And that's the way most conservative Americans see it. Um, there has been a huge backlash against Fox News. Pretty much everyone I know has canceled their Fox News app. They've taken it off their phone. They've canceled their Fox Nation uh, subscription, and they've said they're walking away from Fox News. And I don't blame those Americans one single bit. 
Tucker Carlson uh, on his show, Tucker Carlson Tonight, and on his show on Fox Nation, has been covering the news stories that Americans desperately want to hear because we don't hear them um, largely from the left biased mainstream media in this country. And this is Tucker Carlson is someone that will come back around, but Fox News needs to do the right thing and work with Tucker Carlson and not keep keep his mouth uh, shut with duct tape. They need to let him go and let him out of his contract so that he can do his show and go on to bigger and better things. And we look forward to seeing him come back. It is interesting that he was virtually the only person on cable news, uh, on any network, uh, who was saying some of the things you just expressed, for instance, on uh, Ukraine being a, a proxy war. Do you think he should run for president? Well, I don't know. That would be up to Tucker Carlson. So I'm supporting President Trump for president mm. in 2024. And I have no idea if Tucker would want to do something like that. I think he's more, interesting, more interested in going back to the career that he rightly uh, deserves because he worked so hard at developing it. Uh, speaking of uh, Trump and the 2024 battle, uh, you know, everyone, many people think that DeSantis is eventually going to declare as well. A lot of conservatives uh, like DeSantis want a fresh face, like what he's doing in the state of Florida, can point to his huge successes in the midterms, even versus kind of the general Republican landscape. Um, what, is, what is your case for Trump still being the best person to lead the Republican Party in 2024, given that he did lose to President Biden last time around? Well, I would say uh, it's not really a lot of conservative conservatives that want to see Ron DeSantis run for president. As I watch the polling every single day, he's down, he keeps dropping in the polls. He's down to around 20 percent now um, nationwide polling. So that's not a, a very large portion of conservative Americans. Um, president Trump is the man we want to see back in the White House. And that's because we know his record that he showed the American people for four years. It was a record of success for our country, um, energy independence for the first time in decades. We had world peace for the first time in decades. Um, we had a strong economy. We, we had a strong military and we were respected uh, you know, among the world, especially from world leaders. Um, freedom of speech is important. Our second amendment is, is important. Our children's education is important. Our economy is important and, and lowering crime is a top top priority. So these are the things that we, we know that President Trump brought America, and we want to see all those things come back uh, for, for everyone in this country. I want to come back to something that you said before, Representative, about being a successful businesswoman and thinking that the country needs to be run as a business. I think many populists perceive the, the, that the company already, the country rather, is too much run in that direction. 57 percent of Americans think that billionaires, the extremely rich, should pay more of their fair share. In the uh, the debt ceiling uh, bill that was just passed, there were cuts to assistance for uh, women and children's nutrition and elderly nutrition, three, three million people who have their services cut. And it does seem over and over again that there is an extreme appetite for cutting the budget in ways that disproportionately affect poor and working people, while there's absolutely no appetite for ever taxing elites whose wealth share has grown exponentially over the course of the pandemic when so many people are struggling. So what do you say to folks who say the kind of populism that is being promoted by some people on the right is really a faux populism that really isn't invested in raising the material well-being of the poorest and most working class people in this country? Mm. I really love talking about this topic with you. Um, actually, it's the unholy union of a powerful federal government with big corporations that has created a lot of the problems that we have. And it's the trade deals for decades where we sold out American factories and manufacturers and sent our job, jobs overseas and forced American companies to compete with countries like China and India, Mexico, and many others who use very cheap labor and child labor. You see, our American workers couldn't compete and our American companies couldn't compete to that. And that was the government that made that decision. They sold out American businesses. And by doing so, they sold out America's blue collar workers. What we need to do is we need to break the unholy union between the federal government and big corporations. And we need to make American companies number one in the world again. And we need to stop forcing American companies to unfairly compete with foreign countries. And let's go a bit further there. 
You see, it's the excessive out of control spending in Washington, D.C., and the oversized government that has forced inflation to become so high that's really hurting America's poor. This is something I greatly understand. Um, this is how, this is all that my friends and family, these are the people that I know and love back home in Georgia and many of the Americans that I talk to across the country. Americans are suffering because of the horrible decisions in Washington, D.C. And the horrible decisions in Washington, D.C. are hurting the very people that pay the taxes, that pay the light bills uh, for here, here in this building I'm sitting in. And, and it's, it's time to make that end. Well, I tend to um, agree but the with big the... problem is, is when we have lobbyists that we see every single day coming to lawmakers like me, pushing the interest of, of big companies, big pharma, uh, the military industrial complex and et cetera, but yet we don't see any lobbyists coming here, pushing the interest for the small business owner, you know, mom and dad back home, the mom and pop grocery stores and so forth. That's everything wrong with Washington, and those are the kinds of changes that I want to make. Yeah, I tend to agree with a lot of that, Representative, which is why there's a question about why conservatives have embraced, pushed for uh, the relationship, the ability for people to spend exponentially, frankly, uh, and undermine the one, one person, one vote principles of our democracy. So decisions like Citizens United have greatly expanded the power of corporations to influence the government. Right now, we're in the middle of a discussion about whether the Supreme, members of the Supreme Court have had undue influence because of informal lobbying efforts, people have argued. So would you support efforts to limit, restrict the amount that corporations can spend in politics? Well, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. I can only speak for myself. Um, I don't take donations from lobbyists. That's something that I decided to do from the beginning. Um, and I truly believe that I, each representative, um, all 435 of us, we really are kind of like lobbyists, or we should be for the people and the businesses back home in our districts. Um, so I, I, you know, I'm very interested in looking at some sort of changes possibly that can be made uh, for lawmakers and to reduce the influence of big corporations on, on legislation here in Washington, D.C. and make sure that we have the, the right focus on the American people. Um, but also I'm a business owner, so I do understand the needs of businesses and their ability to be heard um, and things that affect their industry here. So I actually see it both ways. But I just want to remind you, I'm, I'm not really your average conservative or average conservative Republican, because I complain a lot of times about my party just as much as I do about the Democrat Party. Mm. I, I appreciate that. But just on that one point, not taking money from lobbyists is one thing. Not taking money from corporate interests is completely another. I might be mistaken, but very few politicians actually take that no corporate money pledge. Bernie Sanders was one of them. Despite taking that pledge, managed to out fundraise everybody else in the Democratic Party. Would you ever consider swearing off all corporate donations, speaking to, as you have done, how pernicious the influence of corporate money is in politics? Well, I'm really excited to, to tell you that Almost all of my donations are small dollar donors. I think my average donation, and I I'm, could be off by a few dollars and change here, is somewhere around $35 uh, per person. So I, I'm not exactly sure of what my average donor is, but I think it's that it's around that dollar amount. Mm. Um, you know, but I'd have to look at what that pledge looks like because, again, what if I have uh, one of my constituents that that we have the flooring companies. Uh, in Dalton. So I don't want to say I'm going to swear off donations from someone that lives right there in my district. Uh, before we let you go, Congresswoman, wanted to give you a chance to respond to Hunter Biden calling for a House Ethics Office investigation into you. What do you have to say about that? <laughs> I actually was pretty amused um, when I learned about this news. You know, it's really interesting that Hunter Biden, the son of the President of the United States, uh, after, re especially, I went in the Treasury and read the SARS reports. Uh, I've seen what banks were saying about his financial transactions, and I've also read his bank records. And I've seen the wire transfers from China and other foreign countries uh, directly into fake companies. These are LLCs and shell companies that don't produce a product or, or any kind of service. And then I saw in the bank records where Hunter Biden and many of his other family members got paid directly out of these shell companies, these LLCs. So again, I find it really amusing that Hunter Biden is so offended that I would actually talk about that fact 
the, he and his attorneys had to file a complaint with the House Ethics. But you know what? He's an American citizen, and that is his right to do so. Um, I don't think it's going to have any effect, uh, but I, I was happy to share his attorney's letter um, on my on my congressional <laughs> Twitter account. One last question for me, Representative. Um, I actually agreed with you for when you called to defund the FBI. The FBI has historically gone over uh, after left-leaning groups, murdering Fred Hampton and the like, and 85 percent of its budget is actually focused on pursuing uh, left activists, left-leaning individuals. Uh, have you made any moves to actually pursue legislation that would get, get to the bottom of what your goals are there? Or was it, as many people argued at the time, a kind of performative call that was more linked from your perspective to um, absolving uh, Donald Trump from the kinds of interrogations that were happening against him? Mm, no, not, not performative at all. Um, I, I really don't have time for anything like that. I didn't come to Washington to, to be a performer. I came here to make real changes for our country, and um, it's been a difficult change in my life to do so. But I think these changes are very important. I don't think our nation's uh, law enforcement or Department of Justice should be used uh, as a political weapon. That's the weaponization of government. And that's something that should terrify every single American, no matter how they vote. And, and again, the Republican Party has the opportunity to make changes in the budget and the appropriations uh, bills that we pass. And that's where I think that we can make changes like that. And I'm going to work very hard in my conference uh, uh, using the power of my voting card um, to vote for a budget or appropriation bills uh, to be sure that we can hold the FBI accountable and the Department of Justice accountable. And I just think that's the right thing to do. Mm. Have you considered reaching out to any left-leaning members of Congress who share some skepticism, perhaps, about the FBI, for instance, uh, going after these members of the African Socialist People's Party, arresting member last summer, and now going after four of them as uh, Russian, Russian agents? Uh, this is a story um, I'm, I'm not familiar with. Uh, I'm familiar with stories like the FBI targeting parents that are trying to hold their school boards accountable the FBI targeting pro-life protesters, people just praying outside of abortion clinics. Um, I'm familiar with the FBI targeting people that, that walked in the Capitol. Um, you know, they didn't commit any violence. They didn't attack Capitol Police officers. They just walked in open doors and they're still arresting them every single day. So I apologize, I'm not familiar with that story. Um, of course, I would love to talk to Democrat lawmakers um, but tragically, they really aren't interested in talking to me very much. Hmm. That's a shame. It seems like there's some potential for compatibility on holding law enforcement accountable, whether they've uh, mistreated people on the right or on the left. Congresswoman, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it.